Menace Theatre is a special place. There's no doubt about it. It, it is. I tell you, it'll make your eyes water or it'll make you smile. There's nothing in between. It is the most stunning location. It takes me away and completely chills me out. It's a huge honour to be able to live somewhere like here because I can entertain my creative need as well as my needs to be outdoors. Go for a bit of a walk around somewhere and just sit somewhere just for an hour. It's surprising what you'll see around the Menai Strait. The Menai Strait, a magical stretch of sea that separates the Isle of Anglesey from mainland Wales. This series brings you a year in the life of the Strait, capturing the beauty of four glorious seasons and the life cycle of the men and women who live here. The beauty and challenges of life on the most incredible saltwater river in Britain. Supposedly a saying that if you can sail in between them two bridges, you can sail anywhere in the world, and I can, I can probably well believe that. This time is dangerous. It's particularly tricky because of the shallows and the, and the strong tide. You've got to respect it. The way that the tide flows, it's not a case of the water just piling on through in one direction. It's, it's actually coming in two different directions and meeting. There's an hour and a half difference between high water at Penman to Carnarvon Bar, but it's 13 miles apart. So how can you have, you know, what's happening here? Like, is uh, we're on a tilt? It's just such a unique place. It's, it's ever-changing. You know, it can have the massive tides on the springs and less tides on the neaps. It's the changing light, it's the view. That's my number one place, I would say, would be the Straits. The Strait itself is ideal to fuel that passion for marine life, the amount of, of marine life and colour that's packed in to each kind of, you know, square metre is absolutely amazing. And there's nowhere like it in, in, in Europe. The Welsh name for the strait is Avon Menai, which literally means the River Menai. It's a great description. It looks like a great river stretching 16 miles from Penmon in the east to Abermenai in the west. When you're up in the mountains, you see this little thin strip of the strait literally separating the Isle of Anglesey from the mainland. And you realise, of course, that it, you know, at one point everything was connected. If we were stood here 20,000 years ago, we'd be entombed in ice, covering the whole of North Wales. As the earth warmed and as the ice melted, the sea rose. And gradually, over the next few thousand years, the Menai Strait, as it was then, started flooding from either end till it met here in the middle, exactly where we are today. Between these two bridges here, you know, the last point to flood, the last people to walk onto Anglesey without getting their feet wet, walked right across here. There's no question of that. Dr. Michael Roberts is a research fellow at the internationally renowned School of Ocean Sciences, Bangor University. He's an Anglesey man, a marine geologist with a passion for this unique coastal environment. I think it means a lot to me because I spent so long studying it. The heart of my PhD was working out how and when exactly this unique stretch of water evolved. A lot of the work we've been doing is in the ministry in terms of mapping it understanding what it's like when you take the water away. Menai Strait, it's a very dynamic system. You know, in terms of the, the movement of the water, the movement of the materials, the ecology, it's just forever changing. It is an interesting place to study because you've got this kind of range of different environments and habitats within the Strait. So you've got everything from sand to rock to mud in terms of the, the type of things that make up the seabed and you've got different organisms that then colonise those. So it's, it's, it's interesting from the whole School of Ocean Sciences perspective in them being able to bring students out and expose them to different kind of environments, different types of flora and fauna. So we're really, really lucky to be based here, I think, yeah. Good morning, folks. Welcome aboard the Island Princess. I'll introduce myself, I'm Stan, I'm your skipper for today. And on the deck there, 
my pal Matthew. Now Matthew's there to look after you. Any questions, any queries, any concerns, anything at all. Half a word to Matthew, and I'll bet you five when he comes and asks me. <laughs> Dan Zalat is a Bumari spokesman, a local legend and a big, big character. He's a man of many talents and has fingers in most local pies, but his main business is running pleasure trips to Puffin Island. Born and bred under the sound of the swinging daffodil boy. March the 1st, St David's Day. Oh, okay. Hello, don't mind that I'm on television. Right hand side, there's a puffin. This one's behaved itself here, brilliant. These plastic models are good, aren't they? <laughs> oh, crikey, we have some fun. You've got, to, you've got to entertain people. People don't come on here to sit and just look. They want entertaining as well. So if you don't get a bit of a smile or something like that out of them, you don't feel as though you, I don't feel as though I've done my job properly. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of your day, folks. Thank you very much. Okay, That's all right for you. Lunch in a gin and tonic now, is it, ladies? <laughs> Definitely. My father was Polish and he came across during the war. Met me mother and here I am. Enjoy that. <laughs> Born in, uh, in Bomaris. They used to call Bomaris Cockle Town. So I'm a cockle, as they call us. They used to say about my mother, you could take Mary out of Bomaris, but you can't take Bomaris out of Mary, and it's the same with me. Through the veins, down to the coist click. <laughs> HQ to Stan's business empire is Gallows Point, and his beloved shed is the hub of the boat yard. It was a hobby, building our own boats and things like that, my brother and myself, and we just carried on. It's still my hobby but it's earning me some prayers as well, so I'm happy with that. It's absolutely fantastic. Well, I'm 70 next year, <clears throat> and I'm still going to be doing this. As long as I can get a certificate every 12 months to let me do it, I'll carry on. Exciting bit. <laughs> Walk the plank. Emrys Jones runs a cruise boat the other end of the strait at Carnarvon Quay. From Edward I's majestic castle, his striking old ferry boat, the Queen of the Sea, heads west to Abermenai and the mouth of the Menai Strait. It's just a beautiful place and it has its strong tides and uh, its close proximity to the mountains. You've got beautiful views. Before they built the first bridge over Tangles, there were six ferries operating across the straits here, and one of the ferry points was at Carnarvon. Emrys continues a long family tradition of boatmen at Carnarvon. He is the sixth generation of pilots and knows these treacherous waters like the back of his hand. I suppose it's, it's in the blood, isn't it? My grandfather and his ancestors were all Carnarvon pilots, bar pilots. They would do from the bar into Carnarvon. And then you'd have other pilots that would do just the, the middle bits, they would do the swillies between the bridges. And then you had other pilots that did the other end. So if a ship passed all the way through the straits, go through three separate pilots. My grandfather was the first to get a license to do the whole of the Menai Strait. Like his grandfather, Emrys works the whole of the strait. And one of his main piloting jobs is guiding the classic Balmoral cruise ship safely through these dangerous waters. When you first steer a big ship through here, it can be quite stressful yeah, until you're happy that you've done it so many times. That you're, uh, and you still, still try you sometimes. You've still got to be on the ball. You've still got to be careful. There's no place like it for me, be the area between the bridges. It's the most difficult area navigation-wise, but it, it's pretty unique and it's pretty special. It's just a wonderful area to work. It's a magical place. The strait is many things to many people, and for energetic types, it's the perfect playground for adventure activities. I remember people saying to me, 
It's a very strange place to have a sailing centre because the environment is really, really hard. You know, if you can sail here and if you can teach here, yeah, then, uh, then you can work anywhere. Plas Menai is the National Outdoor Centre for Wales. Jamie Johnson and Ali Yates are instructors here. Come on, guys, keep coming and getting these jibes in. How was that jibe, Sam? I whistle and they come. It's amazing, isn't it? I've been very lucky to work all over the world. I've flown out to Australia, Mauritius, a lot of work in Greece, and really to try and explain to new instructors about Tide. I think they must get fed up of me saying, well, at Plasma and I, yeah, because it just is so unique. It's got tides that move in and out four times a day. It makes it uh, very challenging, but also an incredibly safe place to operate because you're only no more than maximum 200 yards from either way to the shore one way or the other. We had a really windy summer this year where lots of kids here wanting to be able to sail and, uh, and we actually get kids on the water you know, when I know other centres couldn't because the nature of the straits it is actually protected from the big waves and swell. Oh. We provide activities for anybody from kind of seven and eight years old to whatever age. So we run everything from what is the, uh, deemed as the placid and calm to probably more the high octane, high adrenaline based type stuff. Uh, within school, there are always people who perform really, really well. There are people who don't perform quite so much. The, the thing with this school playing field, playground, it always changes and it's ever, ever evolving is that those people that are less academic, when they come and they show their skill level and their understanding, it helps them shine as well. And I think when we give people the opportunity to come and do these activities, which allows them to take on board these new life skills, which allow them to hopefully develop as um, fully rounded human beings. I don't think I'd want to be anywhere else. No place comes close to Angleseed for providing the opportunities for adventure and activity that there is nowhere like it. Frankie Hobro runs the Sea Zoo, one of the main tourist attractions on Anglesey. She came here as a student to pursue her passion for marine conservation, fell in love with the area and made her home on the strait. The completely unique thing about the Anglesey Sea Zoo is that we take all our seawater from the Menai Strait and we put it all back in. As an aquarium, we're exclusively completely British. Everything is native. I'm doing business, but I'm also doing conservation work because we're breeding critically endangered species like the British seahorses, both species of British seahorse. We've got spiny lobsters, lobster hatchery of whales, and it's all very sustainable and very environmental. I love them. I love them. We end up generally between 100 and 300 of these juveniles every year, and the rest of these were released at some point over the next few months straight out into the Menai Strait. And the idea is that at this stage, the survivability is a lot higher. So at larvae stage in the wild, they're part of the zooplankton, they're cannibalistic, there's a high percentage of them that get lost. Whereas here we have a fairly high survival rate, and obviously once we reared them to this sort of age and this sort of size, the survival is a lot higher. I've been abroad and I've seen amazing marine life in the tropics. But you come to the UK where everyone has a really good education and where you have this sort of underlying maritime culture till about maybe a century ago, 50 years ago. In general, most Brits know nothing about the sea. They don't know what kind of animals you find. They don't know how colorful they can be, the diversity you can get. They don't know, for example, that we have native turtles. The biggest species of turtle in the world, leatherback turtle, lives here for at least half the year, comes to feed on all these big jellyfish. Nobody even realizes, they assume that turtles are all tropical. Most people have no idea that these things even exist, let alone that they exist here in the UK. In here? are the thornback ray, which are these ones right in front of you. So the thornback ray, a bit like the name suggests, has got thorns all the way down its back and all the way down its tail, and they like to keep themselves to themselves. I came to Anglesey often as a child, so I grew up in the Midlands. It's kind of landlocked city environment. 
but I always loved Anglesey because this is where we used to come. And I spent hours on the beach foraging around in rock pools and this kind of thing. And, and we went out on the boat, we were fishing, we were sailing. When I made the decision to move back here, a lot of my friends thought that I would really struggle. Because I'd been living abroad at that point for sort of eight to ten years, working in tropical islands, really warm places. Doing a lot of hands-on, quite dangerous work sometimes with endangered species. And I guess they kind of thought, oh my God, what the hell is she doing? But then when they come and visit, they just kind of saw the whole lifestyle and the whole environment and went, do you know what? I can see why you do it. This is you, this is your kind of place. The fact that I'm here, living on an island by the sea, with this incredible view every morning, it's the most stunning place I've lived out of all the places I've lived. The unique marine conditions in the strait make this underwater world one of the richest farmlands in Wales. It's a perfect environment for growing mussels, and these Menai mussel beds are the most productive in the United Kingdom. With the Menai Strait, we're very, very lucky here compared to anywhere else in the UK, really. It's sheltered from most weather. And then the second thing, and the most important, I suppose, is the fact that the water is continuously running from each side, so the feed is continuously coming in for the mussels. It is an absolutely wonderful place to grow the mussels. John Jones is a mussel boatman working from Porth Penryn near Bangor. Born and bred in Bangor, tried various jobs after leaving school without an exam to my name. And eventually, I think 22, 23 years ago now, probably, ended up down here, uh, bought in a few lobster pots of somebody and really got into the game, and I'm here ever since. Absolutely beautiful day. You can think any better than this. A little bit of an easterly wind, but uh, just cools everything down a little bit. So, beautiful sunshine. The whole process is basically farming. Basically, we've got a tractor there, hasn't got wheels on it, floors, hasn't got a brake on it. And the other thing, for me, if it's, a, if it's a farmer, he's going up and down the field there cutting his silage, he can see the grass ahead of him. Imagine that farmer trying to do it blindfold because that's what, exactly what I'm doing on that thing, is I'm catching the mussels and I've got to catch every single mussel on it without being able to see that, the, the mussel bed. So I have to know by looking at the electronics and everything else and experience of where the mussels are to make sure they get every last one there with, uh, in the bags and away. Probably about four of the mussel uh, coming up in one go at the moment. So it's, uh, yeah. Fishing doesn't really get much better than that. <laughs> you know, to me, uh, it's, uh, we talk about the muscle beds here, and you're talking about the whole of the Menestrates, but I've said that there's no better stretch of water in, in the whole world. If there is such a thing as, a, as the ideal job where you know, you're out there, you're enjoying yourself, you're doing what you like, you, you're getting that challenge and, and thing, then there's no better place. People quite often talk about the light. There are different qualities to light in different areas, but I think what's more important to me predominantly as a landscape photographer is the variation. You see sunbursts casting beams across the landscape and you get shadows of the clouds scudding across the hillsides that actually makes it rather magic. Glyn Davis is a multi-award winning landscape photographer. He's published five books, two of which were bought by the Prime Minister in 2011 as a royal wedding gift for William and Kate. Making images really much stemmed from my family background. All my family are artists. My dad was a senior lecturer in fine art printmaking. My mum was a textile designer and a ceramicist. And when we were kids, almost all of our free time, when we weren't in school, we'd be out walking the cliffs and we would be encouraged to draw and to paint the landscape um, from a very, very, very early age. But I was impatient, so the camera became a way of being creative. I was still thinking about composition and light and colour and form and texture, but I was able to move really quickly and I was able to travel, and that meant a lot to me. 
I'm just looking for any birds that might be flying across just to create some extra movement in the picture. The sparkles are gorgeous. You could be in, in the Mediterranean here. You can see all the birds actually on the sandbank that they're all quite happy just sitting there. This is why I don't do wildlife photography. You need way more patience than I've got. I might just stick to my sparkly water. When I'd left London after doing my degree down there, I was desperate to get out of the city and I wanted to get back down to Cornwall. And within, I think, about eight months of returning to Cornwall, my mum and dad decided they were going to move to North Wales to live. I think just by default, I actually ended up just coming with them. And suddenly, I was living in this place that was somewhere that was only ever connected with holidays. This was just a place we came to see Nine and Tide. Glyn has made Anglesey his home. And to showcase his work, he runs his own photo gallery in Menai Bridge. What people don't realise until you actually run a gallery is, of course, you are not just looking at pretty pictures, you are running a business. And, of course, with all businesses these days, it's the admin, it's the legalities, it's the paperwork, it's dealing with tax, it's all the things that sort of, like, do your head in, which are the absolute opposite of what I come out into the landscape for. But at least... I can come out into the landscape. I don't do this for the money. I'm only doing this because it's a way of life. And that's why I'll pay the compromise of never being, I'll never die a rich man, but I will hopefully die a happy one. Over the next few weeks, we'll follow the lives of these men and women of the Straits and catch a glimpse of a unique way of life on this incredible saltwater river. Next time, winter, and Frankie gets an unexpected guest. She was pretty much literally at the bottom of the drive on the beach. It clearly wasn't completely dead, but it was really close to being dead. Stan and Emrys repair their boats. I didn't ask you to come in here and wreck the blooming ship. What's the matter with you? And Glyn escapes to the hills. Some of the best light and some of the most dramatic conditions for my photography are actually in the winter. <laughs>